Hello and welcome back to another Monster Monday, a series where I draw a creature from D&D and I talk about its lore and its mythology and what it's like to fight in game as well. When I'm making these videos I like to use your suggestions for monsters that you'd like to see because there's so many that I can't possibly pick by myself. So if while you're watching this video you suddenly think of a monster you'd really like to see me draw make sure to leave that down below in the comment section. I catalogue every single one of your suggestions which I then add to a monthly poll which my patrons over on Patreon get to vote on and essentially through popular popularity they get to pick which ones of the monster suggestions you leave me they want to see next. Today they have picked the peculiar and slimy Boggle which was first suggested quite a while ago by DM Enterez, a longtime follower of the channel. But more recently, Bronwyn Haller, one of my patrons, has been championing this also. So to both of you, I hope you enjoy today's video. And to the rest of you, let's get started with today's topic and talk about some boggles, shall we? Boggles are absolutely fascinating creatures because, in my opinion, they're one of the monsters who are most dissimilar in appearance and attitude to their folklore inspiration in D&D. Now, D&D, historically, has a bit of a habit of borrowing really cool ideas, creatures, and challenges from mythologies from all over the world, and some of these are preserved brilliantly, I might add. Some are exaggerated and improved on for use in games, and maybe a bit more sort of combat stuff is added to them, and some of them are, well, totally misunderstood. And that's not to say that these monsters are bad in any capacity, and it's hard to blame the creators of D&D when Dungeons & Dragons was first being made. The internet was not a thing. We did not have access to every nugget of information ever recorded. The potential for misunderstandings was more likely, and translating mythological creatures into something that is viable and interesting in a game setting is difficult. Ultimately, all of these creatures and facets inspired by different mythologies become fun features of the game. But in my opinion, Boggles have ended up getting a bit of a raw deal when it comes to being pushed through the D&D mythology sieve. In D&D, Boggles are small, chaotic, neutral, troublemaking fey introduced in 1st edition's Monster Manual 2, which was released in 1983, and more recently appeared in 5th edition's Volo's Guide to Monsters. Their appearance has varied from artist to artist over the years, but generally they tend to look like little, creepy, blue-skinned humanoids with long, gangly arms, large hands and feet, and an enormous head which occupies perhaps half to about two-thirds of their whole body. They're usually covered in a slippery or maybe oily black slime that they constantly secrete, which, by the way, they can produce more of this ooze at will, or perhaps when they're panicked, but they have an incredible degree of control over it, allowing it to become sticky like tar at will, or alter its properties to easily return to its lubricant-like state as a bonus action. This liquid, which is unsurprisingly enough known as boggle oil, is very hard to capture or farm because it tends to dry up and disappear from our reality when left on any surface for an hour. But we're also told that this magical ebony mucus is non-flammable, so it's hard to tell why someone would want to seek out any or obtain some, but perhaps it could leave some kind of magical residue that might be useful in the pigmentation of inks, perhaps. But otherwise I couldn't find any details indicating why someone would want some. Either way. In its slippery state, the boggle gains advantage on acrobatics checks made to escape any confines or squeeze through even the tightest of spaces or escape someone grappling or attempting to capture them. In its more sticky state, the boggle gains advantage on athletics checks to climb difficult surfaces, hold onto objects or grapple people, and it also gains the ability to have a spider climb-like feature as a result of being coated in this glue-like slime. Additionally, and the thing that I find most interesting about Boggles, is that they have one of the most amazing powers in the whole game, and one of those things that I think players will be begging for a magic item that does something similar, because these creatures essentially have the powers of portal guns, allowing them to make an imperceptible hole in the fabric of reality as a bonus action, mind you, needing only a solid surface or a frame-like window or open doorway within five feet of the creature. These portals can be no larger than 10 feet squared. That's still a bloody big hole in reality. And unfortunately, the portals can only be 30 feet apart in our spatial dimensions, but they allow the Boggle to effortlessly interact with anything on the other side 
travel through these portals, either partially or fully, and even see through the holes, even though they are technically invisible and no one else can see them. They're also fully capable of bringing or throwing objects, or even people, through these portals, and there's technically no limit to the number of these portals that they can make, although they can only produce them as a bonus action, and they disappear at the end of the boggle's next turn. So, if there's some sort of magic item that you could give to a boggle, or that a boggle could obtain, some sort of spell, or, well, you know, you're inventive, if there's something that gives a boggle extra actions, or additional bonus actions, they could potentially have several of these portals open at any given time. They only have two fairly measly attacks. The first is a, quote, pummel attack, where they physically clonk someone for 1d6 minus 1 bludgeoning damage. Yep, that's right, you heard that correctly, minus one. They have only eight strength. And their other attack features this slime ability. They're able to produce a puddle of ooze, which they can use to knock people over when it's slippery, or cause it to become sticky and inconvenience people. But they can be incredibly lethal because of these portals, which aren't even a part of their attacks. If they were to create portals in just the right places, they could drop any object that fits into a 10 foot cube on top of someone from a great height, thanks to their spider climbing, or even use these portals to drop a whole person into a deadly trap, or perhaps off a cliff or even out of a window, while the portals have to remain within 30 feet of each other and are created through touch. If the boggle itself is positioned incredibly far away from someone but can still see them, there's nothing to say that they couldn't drop the equivalent of a D&D fridge from the top of a skyscraper onto someone. Fundamentally, as Fey, they are most inclined to use these powers for mischief rather than for deadly harm, but we are told that they're often sought out by sorcerers, wizards, and most frequently by warlocks, who make pacts with the Fey in hopes of attaining a boggle under their command to use their skill with teleportation, and for other reasons for which a boggle servant might be seen as incredibly useful. Maybe if you run out of superglue. They are, after all, a challenge rating 1 8th creature, so with the power to summon Fey through spellcasting, most players will usually try and pick boggles for as long as anyone can stand in their presence. Relationships with boggles tend not to last very long, because a bored boggle will often make use of its incredible powers to cause havoc for those around them. While they are intelligent enough to speak Sylvan, they do only have intelligence of six, which makes them around as smart as a displacer beast, and far more in line with the intelligence of animals rather than the average human. Maybe they're about as smart as a dog, or perhaps a pig's level of intelligence, which are roughly comparable, although I believe pigs are slightly smarter than dogs, apparently. So they don't understand why their desire to sow mischief by smashing the belongings of those whose homes they cohabit or adventurers they follow would be seen as irksome in any way, or why they would subsequently become banished from these homes and from these adventuring parties. They have an incredibly keen sense of smell, having advantage on all perception checks that rely on their nose, so it may be drawn to places with strong odours. Those who keep boggles as familiars often find their priceless texts, altars to demon princes and artefacts of great magical importance, teleported to the nearby pig pens or into the sewers because the boggle thought they'd smell more interesting there than in some dusty display cabinet or stuffy office of magical study that they were once beautifully preserved in. More than strong smells, though, boggles are drawn to loneliness and despair. They manifest in the dark places of the Feywild, where the material plane overlaps and a strong sense of isolation pierces through the gloom like a knife. They are the sadness of an abandoned or neglected child given mischievous form, left to wreak havoc on those that would forsake them, and a not-so-imaginary friend for them to play with. They are irritating nuisances that cause the grieving family to pick themselves up from their all-consuming gloom and focus on their hatred of the pest that has taken up unwelcome residence in their space. In a sense, they are accidentally helpful while fully intending to do the opposite, but more often than not, they are terrible house guests to those who cannot control their great potential power and can't buy enough mops and buckets to clean away all of the slime that they constantly produce, and nail down all the objects that they don't want teleported into random nearby houses. Hey, I just wanted to take a brief moment to say a massive, massive thank you to all of my supporters on Patreon. 
but in particular those of you who have chosen to support at the Silver Archfey level and above actually. This month you guys are Raptor Dio, Ken Doman or Kendoman, Ryan H, Christian Palmer Smith or Kit, Max Schluter, Amanda and Jake Westfall, Darth Katana, Duck Quack, Peter Balf, Aldrin, Ethan Dibbe, Oliver Thorvald Melock, Sam Hickson, Bork Boulderbender, Colby Monroe, Styrax, Sky Rush Soul, Nap in Camo, Steve Harrison, Trevor Traub, Dan Waterman, Nathan Stratton, Jonathan Foster, Tim Klima, Dominique Jolly, Brandon Kerr, Brock Harris, Yorick Beese, Benjamin Colburn, Tamling Darkraven, Max Copeland, and AJ. Thanks to these guys, I get to make this content and you get to see this content. So thank you all so, so much for your support. If you'd like to join the community that we have over on Patreon and get unique rewards, like this nifty little shout out, copies of all of my illustrations, including the one that you're watching right now, one-on-one -on -one hangouts, and the chance to be one of my commission corners, then please make sure to look out for the Arcane Forge over on Patreon. I'll leave a link to that down below in my description box. And thank you so much for taking the time out to help me thank these people for the video that I had the pleasure to make and you are hopefully enjoying watching. Anyway, I won't take up any more of your time, and I hope you enjoy the rest of the video. Now, I mentioned that they were inspired by something that there is a real mythological version of Boggles. And if you've only encountered these creatures in D&D, and I can't blame you, you might be thinking of Boggles are some sort of cute, funny, little cheeky, pesky creatures who are, after seeing this video, every warlock packed to the fey or druid with summoning powers, their new pet. They will almost certainly be seeking out to gather these creatures as allies, because who doesn't want a living portal gun near them? But their real-world counterpart is so far the opposite that it beggars belief. Boggles, or Bogles in Scottish folklore, is a term for a ghostly spirit, whose name shares an origin with goblins. For those who didn't see the Goblin Monster Monday, there's a Middle English word called Burger, B-U-G-G-E, which came from a German or Proto-German word, Burger, B O with an umlaut G G E, which some of you are now starting to hear the inspiration of this creature if I add the additional word that is usually hyphenated onto the end of this man, Burgerman or Bogeyman. But more specifically, this is connected to the Irish Gaelic word like Bagert, Bagert, which literally means threat. Eventually, folklore stories of Bogles and goblins would make their way to the Americas, where these threatening ghosts became a term still used in American folklore today, and that of the bogeyman or boogeyman. Now, I've been really excited to research the bogeyman because they're a creature that I always seem, you know, it always seems to come up in Hollywood films and American TV shows, but the rest of the world doesn't really tell stories of the bogeyman. It's a legend that lives on in the hearts of fearful American children, but only exists an expression elsewhere, like a bugbear being something that bothers you, or a demon being someone's own personal vices, you know, grappling or wrestling with their own personal demons. In the UK, a bogey is a word used only in childhood and refers to balls of snot, and so the idea of a bogey man is more comical and gross than it is terrifying, but the word once meant something dangerous or devilish, and it's that interpretation that has travelled across the sea to congeal into this bogeyman creature. For those like myself who are not from the Americas, the bogeyman is an American legend which is a manifestation of fear itself, the creature that lives under the bed, in the cupboard, at the end of the bed, hiding in the corner where the clothes pile up the terror in the darkness, who manifests as everything that someone might fear. There's no real physical descriptions of what the bogeyman might look like, because they're constructed out of the individual fears of those experiencing this creature, but they're usually likened to the Judeo-Christian devil as a warping, shifting, singular entity that can plague multiple people in different ways. One interpretation of the bogeyman, and potentially the most well-known, belongs to the stitched fabric creature, or monster, which made its presence in The Nightmare Before Christmas, most likely inspired by stories of the, quote, sack man from Eastern European folklore, a creature who occupies a fairly similar, if not identical, niche to the bogeyman, and who's said to steal children in a sack, a hessian bag. In many ways, 
The bogeyman is fear itself. Sort of corrupting and bastardizing the phrase, there is nothing to fear but fear itself. Now, if there's a creature that represents fear itself, then there suddenly is something to fear. And that is the bogeyman. But that's a far cry from this boggle that we have before us. But there's something to that adage, nothing to fear but fear itself, that I think is the reason why we can homogenize and glue together these two interpretations of bogeyman and the boggle. The boggle is a creature that makes disproportionate mischief. It's like a poltergeist, something ethereal that can't physically touch you, but can knock around all the items in your home, making it feel like there's a real disruptive presence in your house causing panic, chaos, fear, and insomnia in those who are experiencing one of these creatures living in their home. But in reality, when one faces up to their fears, they are usually much less scary. So the chaos that a boggle might cause might cause someone to believe that there is something monstrous and huge and disruptive, something terrifying, a curse even, on their home. But the reality is that it's just this little goblin-like fey creature who gets bored and disruptive and has immeasurable nuisance abilities and could be likened to something like Pennywise in Stephen King's It, something that gains more power the more that you fear it, but the more confident you are, the less you fear this creature, the less you give it to feed, the less terrifying it becomes, the more manageable it becomes. And I really wanted to encapsulate both ideas of a boggle and the bogeyman in this creature as I was illustrating it. And I'm really pleased with how this drawing came out because I wanted to make something terrifying in one light, but to see it openly and to stare it in the face, it could still be conceived of as cute. So I used all of the elements. I went over the top with all these disgusting, horrifying, terrifying features of this creature. I've mentioned in many videos that I'm terribly arachnophobic, so I kind of inspired this thing loosely on spider-like features. It has this kind of like carapace-like arms, way too many eyes. There's no symmetry to it whatsoever, making it a little bit jarring to look at. It has all these exposed organs that tiny little spider-like hands are holding in. All this ooze and slime gushing away from it. But I kept the proportions of the D&D &D boggle. I gave it this massive head. I made it look quite weak and frail. I tried to make it look cheeky and perhaps a little bit nervous, like a child who has been brought in front of the headmaster for playing pranks, ready to face punishment, but still giggling a little bit at the mischief that they have unleashed. And I wanted to leave it in this no man's land, somewhere between being something frightening and something sweet. That If we understand this creature and we can look past its obvious, horrifying elements, its behaviour comes from a place of wanting to entertain, to be cheeky. And ultimately, the fact that it's summoned through abandonment and sadness, that it just wants to get up and go. It's perhaps the latent energy that has built up in a child's mind when they experience so much sadness and they can't go out and act like a kid. This could be their sadness and their childlike energy manifest into one creature. And I think I pretty much managed to cover that. But I really like this interpretation of a boggle, and I suppose being fear itself... A boggle can manifest however you want it to, whether you want to use the original D&D version that looks like a little midnight blue gnome, or you want to use something a little bit more creepy, or anything in between. Let me know how you describe boggles in your campaigns, or if you've used any, what mischief they've got up to. And until next time, remember there is nothing to fear but fear itself. And happy monster hunting.